past weeks we've been talking about honor and shame and how that is ingrained into many different cultures, particularly cultures of the Bible. But there's a kind of shame that is more known in our culture and in our time. And that's kind of the shame I want to talk about today. I want to make sure to address this kind of shame on its own. Let's read Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far off from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. And you are fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. I knew I was cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me, like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue stinks, sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. You, my help. Come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. And stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. And he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you, for kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. So we've been talking about honor and shame. Some shame is from the group, the groups that we belong to. Every group has a system of honor and shame that kind of reinforces its values. I've been saying that for the past few weeks now. And when you act against the ideals or the values of the group, uh, whether that's your family or a job that you work at, your friends or, or your country, there is going to be some shame involved. That might be just getting a sour glance. It might be getting booed. It might be getting thrown in jail. But somehow that is going to be reinforced. So some shame is from the group. Some shame is healthy, too. Now, some shame that comes from the group is unmerited. But sometimes we're acting out of line and it's good to be brought back into line. There are some people who deserve to be booed. There are some people who deserve to be, get thrown in jail and so forth. 
And if a sour glance makes us, you know, rethink what we're doing, then maybe that's a good thing. So some shame is, is deserved. But some shame is pathological. Pathological meaning like a sickness, something that's not working right. Now, we're not talking about shame that's feeling guilt for something that you did, but for who you are. Now, now not all of you suffer from this, but I know that some of you do. And so this sermon is especially for you today. This kind of shame is a gnawing self-doubt that drives people toward perfectionism or withdrawal or timidity or maybe combativeness. It's something, when something goes badly, somehow it's your fault. Or if you have the thought that if, if everybody knew something that you had done in the past, then they would never love you again. When you receive a nice gift or a compliment, you kind of even feel a little bit guilty, like you don't deserve it. Pathological shame is where you're, you say, I am a worm and not a man. Like, It says in the psalm that we read today, where you feel less than human and you deserve less than what other people deserve. Shame is a strong sense of being uniquely and hopelessly different and less than other human beings, according to one book that I read. Louis Smeads has a really great book on shame. It's called Shame and Grace. And uh, he has a bunch of different statements that people who have shame will think to themselves or feel within themselves. I sometimes feel as if I am a fake. I feel that if people who admire me really knew me, they might have contempt for me. I feel inadequate. I seldom feel as if I am up to what is expected of me. When I look inside myself, I don't feel any joy at what I am. I feel inferior to the really good people that I know. God must be disgusted with me. I cannot measure up to what I ought to be. I will never be acceptable. If if you've had those thoughts or you often have those thoughts, then you probably have pathological shame. This kind of shame, unlike other kinds, is completely useless. It's useless shame. It doesn't help you. It doesn't help anybody else. It just keeps you down and pulls you down. And like shame that is helpful and beneficial, that maybe sets us back on a good course, that shame is temporary. This shame is unending. It's permanent. It's kind of always there. It's kind of just ready to pull you down if you get a little bit confident in yourself. It, and it does it to no end. It's endless and purposeless. And it's a false shame. It's not based on reality. If you do something that's wrong and you feel ashamed about it, then that shame is based on truth. You feel a temporary shame and you change course, maybe make some apologies and reparations perhaps, and then that shame goes away. That's normal shame. This kind of shame It doesn't matter how much you apologize, how much reparations you make, you always feel like you're a horrible person. Psalm 31, 18. Let the lying lips be mute, which speak insolently against the righteous in pride and contempt. All of this is based on lies. Stuff that is not true, but stuff that, for those of you with pathological shame, somehow still believe. Or accept. It says in the passage we read, I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me, they make mouths at me, they wag their heads. And they say, when it says they make mouths at me, that's kind of a, an idiom or an expression for a sneer. Pathological shame is is learned. It's reinforced by 
the experiences that we have. It's learned from a bunch of different things and a combination of different things. Some places that we learn pathological shame from the world's false ideals. The world kind of has its own ideas about what is good, beautiful, worth our time, worth our money. And the world goes after those things. And if you don't measure up, or if you don't fit into that, you get left behind. You're supposed to have the best things, you're supposed to accomplish the best goals, you're supposed to win the best trophies, you're supposed to earn the best salary, and you're supposed to look the best, be the most beautiful, wear the best clothes, and so forth. These are the world's ideals. And you can learn shame from that. Not that you should be better, but that you are just simply less. You learn pathological shame from graceless religion. And this is something that we as Christians and we as churches, we always need to be paying attention to because we can very easily slip into this. Because as much as we want to reinforce good behavior, it's very easy to be reinforcing good behavior and getting that condescending holier than thou, you're less of a person because you've made a mistake. We always have to be on guard for this. Graceless religion is faith that is based on rules and human traditions. It's not based on grace alone or Christ alone or God's word alone. It always leads to hypocrisy and it's about maintaining appearances rather than what is actually in the heart. And it creates an illusion that we are good Christians by just following rules. Let's always be on guard for that. Pathological shame is learned from being rejected. Being rejected by friends, being rejected maybe by family, being rejected by classmates. And not everybody who experiences rejection is going to have pathological shame. Some people see rejection as a challenge and they rise up to that challenge. But for people with pathological shame, those rejections will add up and you will never forget them and it will continually weigh you down even more. Pathological shame is learned from a harsh childhood. Young children don't understand how the world works. They haven't been around as long. They internalize everything bad that happens to them. So children who are abused often think the abuse is their fault. Like it was because of something that they did wrong. Young children don't have knowledge or experiences or wisdom for decisions or discernment, and so they believe anything, anything that adults tell them, including, you're lazy, you're incompetent, and you're awful, you're a burden. Young children don't have the size, the muscle, or coordination to accomplish tasks like grown-ups do. They're, they're clumsy. And so when we expect children to act like grown-ups, they don't take that as, you know, I need to just be better. They take that as they are personally deficient. They internalize it. There's this really good example here that I read in this book. I want to read it to you. I was standing in line at a crowded public restroom engaged in one of my favorite hobbies, people watching when I observed a brief interaction between a mother and daughter. Mother looked harried and weary as she wrestled a huge purse in the one hand and a cigarette in the other while waiting for her child to emerge from a toilet stall. When the girl did, the beautiful bright-eyed daughter marched over to a row of sinks to wash her hands dutifully. On the way, she dropped the jacket she was carrying. Mother snatched it from the floor and shot off a disgusted look which missed its mark since her daughter was engrossed in enthusiastic hand-washing. Water and soap suds splashed on the mirror, the sink, the floor, and child, while she scrubbed as if about to perform open-heart surgery. Again, mother released a nonverbal volley of disgust. Finally, the little beauty finished drying her hands and turned around with self-satisfaction and delight from bursting from her face only to be assaulted by her mother's inescapable barrage of displeasure, disgust, and disappointment. Mother scolded, 
punched her child's shoulder and pointed to the water and suds and then threw in carelessness with her jacket for good measure. She hit her target dead center this time. While the girl was being shoved out the door, her eyes seemed to bleed with sorrow and shame as she cast an apprehensive glance at her angry mother. The mother's attitudes, actions, and words conveyed to her daughter that the child was a disgusting disappointment when she accidentally dropped a jacket and splashed water and soap suds. In reality, both behaviors are quite unremarkable for a child her age. Mother's behavior betrayed her unrealistic expectations. They needlessly fostered a sense of shame in the child. So we can learn shame from our childhood too. When we have unrealistic expectations placed on us and we are shamed for not meeting those expectations, we carry that shame. And we can learn shame from being used for another's personal gain. Whether that's a parent taking out a bad day at work in physical abuse, or whether that's being used for another's sexual gratification, or whether that's even something like putting 20 years in at a company and working hard faithfully every day only to be just cast aside one day simply because they wanted a numbers on a chart to look a little better. Or maybe being bullied by somebody because they want to appear strong or they want to act out a narcissistic ego. These are all things that can teach us this pathological shame. Now people respond to this kind of shame in different ways. If you have pathological shame, it doesn't necessarily mean you respond to it the same way. Some people with pathological shame spend their entire lives chasing greatness, whether that's status or titles or money or fame or something like that. They might try to play the shame game even better, and they will get super critical and have that holier-than-thou attitude. Or maybe they'll go from one abusive relationship to another. Or maybe they'll drown it in alcohol, drugs, and other substances. People respond to this kind of shame in all different ways. But the answer to pathological shame is the truth of grace in Jesus Christ. That is the answer to pathological shame. In verse 24, for he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. That him is not David. That him is Jesus Christ. When Jesus was risen from the dead, he was redeemed and exonerated from all of the shame that was heaped upon him. And in that, we receive grace from God. Jesus voluntarily enters shame. Shame that is undeserved. Shame that is false. Philippians 2, 5, and 8, 5 through 8. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus entered into shame. Shame that definitely was not merited. When you're the son of God, you deserve to be carried on the highest pedestal that the world can offer you. But instead, he took on the greatest shame that the world could offer. And he took all of our shame of sin upon himself. Sin is what brings shame. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, the first thing that happened is they realized that they were naked and they hid. They felt shame. That was a healthy shame, but it was still shame. Sin when we are sinners and we stand before a holy God, 
we would feel nothing but shame. And Jesus took all of that shame upon himself on the cross. Whatever shame that we might legitimately have, Jesus himself took. So we do not need to have lingering shame. He took our shame. That was on him. We don't need to take it back. We don't need to shame ourselves. He's been shamed for us. He bore that permanent shame so that we wouldn't have to. Temporary shame that makes us change course or say that we're sorry, that's good. But that permanent shame, he bore that. We don't have to carry that. He shows that dignity comes not from people, but from God. This false pathological shame comes from other people telling us that we're no good, that we're less. True honor, though, comes from what God says about us, not what other people say about us. Other people don't know us, not like God does. What really counts is what God says. And Jesus demonstrates this. So when we shamed the Son of God, when he should have been at the highest pedestal, God honored him. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So the one that we shamed so badly, God vindicated and gave him glory. God knows who we really are. We look on the outward appearance and when we saw Jesus, we saw somebody who wasn't going to meet our expectations, so we got rid of him. But God redeemed him. If you belong to Christ, if you believe in Jesus Christ, and you have that forgiveness of sins, and you belong to him, then you even now are seated at God's right hand. Even now. The way that Ephesians 2 words this is important. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even while we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Jesus, then you are seated at God's right hand with him now even. Not someday, now. And that's the greatest honor of all. Nobody can honor you more than this. Let's look at the screen. Let's answer this together. What good does it do you, however, to believe all of the things that are taught in the Apostles' Creed? In Christ, I am right with God an heir to life everlasting. In Christ, we are heir to everlasting life, and we stand perfectly clean before God. We don't have to be ashamed. Even, we don't have to be ashamed in front of the one who knows every last detail of our lives. That's pretty incredible. Some of us are afraid of what other people might find out about our past or what we really are on the inside. But God knows exactly what we've done throughout entire lives and knows exactly what's on the inside. And he loves us and we stand right with him. Pathological shame, which I know some of you have and deal with, is healed by grace. It's healed by God's grace. You don't have to be the best. Jesus said the last will be first. Louis Smedes wrote in his book, Grace is the beginning of our healing because it offers the one thing we need most, to be accepted without regard to whether we are acceptable. 
whether we are acceptable or not, and all of us are sinners, doesn't matter because in Christ we belong to the Lord. Let's look and let's respond here again. How are you right with God? Only by true faith in Jesus Christ, even though my conscience accuses me of having grievously sinned against all God's commandments and of never having kept any of them, and even though I am still inclined toward all evil, nevertheless, without my deserving it at all, out of sheer grace, God grants and credits to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ, as if I had never sinned nor been a sinner, as if I had been as perfectly obedient as Christ was obedient for me. All I need to do is to accept this gift of God with a believing heart. That's grace. And the more that sinks into your mind and into your soul, the more you will heal from pathological shame. Because of Jesus, we have grace, which means you are accepted by God first. You're accepted first. Your relationship with Him is not in jeopardy by mistakes. It doesn't mean you're accepted if you follow rules and traditions. You're accepted first. You might be disciplined. You might be challenged. Sure, God is our Father. Good fathers do that. But you will never be abandoned. You will never be discarded. And you will never be told that you are less. In Jesus, you're accepted by the only opinion that actually matters. Other people have their thoughts, their opinions, but they're human opinions. They're based on limited knowledge, limited experience. Who cares at some point, right? They don't really know everything. Verse 28 for kingship belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. Kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. That's the opinion that matters. The world values people for their knowledge, their experience, and their power and their influence, but God is the only one who really counts. In Jesus, there is immunity to any false shame. If you can be rooted in Christ, and if you are rooted in Christ, then any false shame that people might heap on you, you can resist. Jesus said these astounding words here. He said, Do not resist the one who is evil. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. When he said that, remember from a few weeks ago, your face is your seat and your head is the seat of honor. If somebody smacks you with the left hand, that is the unclean hand. If somebody takes what is unclean and puts it at your seat of honor, that is a grave insult. And Jesus says, if somebody dishonors you that horribly, offer the other cheek. Why? Because you have immunity to false shame. Nobody can shame you. Smead says to experience grace is to, to recover our lost inner child. The heart of our inner child is trust. Shame cheats us of childhood. Grace gives it back to us. The trusting child does not have a worry in the world about whether he is smart enough or handsome enough or whether he has accomplished enough with his life or been good enough to be acceptable to his parent. He trusts that the someone who holds him, warms him, feeds him, cradles him, and loves him will accept him again and always. Trust is the inner child we rediscover 
and an experience of grace. And when God is our Father, that is the experience of grace. In Jesus, we join others who received the same grace and have no other boast other than Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So we join together with other people who have been saved the same way that we have. The same group that reminds us that we are immune to false shame. The same people who can build us up in what truly counts. In verse 22 it says, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation I will praise you. In verse 25, from you comes my praise in the great congregation. We gather together to celebrate who God is and what Jesus has done for us. And in that fellowship, we build each other up so that we can be healed and we can resist the pathological shame that the world gives to us. If you noticed as we read, the psalm that started to be so low and so discouraging and so awful ends by in giving praise to God. In Christ, when you experience pathological shame and you experience His healing and that growth, it ends in praise. Grace gives us unrestrained focus on praising God. When you have that healing grace of the Lord and it focuses you just on who the Lord is, not on what other people think or your deficiencies, it focuses you on, you on what matters most. Self-shaming takes a lot of self-focus, but the grace of God points us to what it matters most and keeps us focused on that. The more you believe and live the truth of the honor of God's grace, the more that pathological shame will fade away. Let's bow our heads and let's pray together. Lord, our God in heaven, it's an amazing gift that you've given to us in Jesus Christ that we can have the grace that comes from him, that we can stand before you perfect and flawless and never less. So Lord, Please sink that into our minds and into our souls so that we can resist pathological shame and that we can help heal those who have pathological shame. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.